I am Margaret Toscano, and I am a scholar of Mormon studies. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to continue our conversation with Dr. Margaret Toscano of the University of Utah. We'll talk about more about her past studies on the theological case for women and priesthood. I have to say I learned a ton about priesthood from Margaret, and I think you will too. It's a really fun conversation, and she really opens my eyes and yours, hopefully. Check out our conversation. I also want to mention that Beyond the Block seeks to center the narratives of the marginalized in conversations on Mormonism. A black lifelong member and queer theologian, Brother Jones and Brother Knox seek to fill the gaps between Mormon theology and Mormon culture that people of all kinds of identities may claim a seat at the table of Christ. They do a great job over there at Beyond the Block, and I encourage you to check it out. Now back to our conversation. You know, it's, it, it's been a challenge, um, and in a way my academic career does mirror um, sort of my challenges within the church. So now if we kind of go back, I'm, after I told you sort of my academic kind of journey, um, and I go back now and look at um, my church journey, so at BYU, I'm concerned about women's issues. I really have this religious question um, that, you know, what does, what does God want for me? You know, is the narrative of the church, priesthood is for men, motherhood is for women, and kind of these separate spheres, and that if you want priesthood, you must be either not a good woman or not very spiritual or something like that. And I think that the reason I began to concentrate on the, the question of priesthood was because for me, I realized that priesthood was more than an office in the church or even a job in the church. That if you, the more I studied the words of Joseph Smith and the scriptures, which I was a really avid student of the scriptures, you know, wanting to read them in Greek and Hebrew and all of that, mm -hmm. that that priesthood, I began to see, was something more than that. That it was, it, that priesthood was about a spiritual relationship between an individual and God. And the more I read from Joseph Smith, that is actually how I think his central idea of priesthood is. That for him, priesthood is this spiritual power that you receive from God and that it puts you in a relationship with God that eventually is to transform you into the image of God. And it's part of a spiritual rebirth, maturation, transformation, exaltation. And so my theological question was, if that's really what priesthood is, then women should have it too. So about that same time, in the early 70s, I went to the temple. And I actually went to the temple before I got married and I didn't go on a mission. I just wanted, again, I was somebody who was very interested and... That wasn't very common in the 70s, No, right? it was not common at all. Um, but I persuaded a bishop to let me go. And I had a number of spiritual experiences in the temple where I felt endowed with priesthood power. And because I had been an English major, <laughs> I love saying this, right? If you're an English major and then you study ancient languages and ancient cultures, you're trained to look at symbols and patterns and to think about things maybe in a way that most people wouldn't, you know? So I began to see in the temple the symbols of you know, wearing the garments of the priesthood, that you have all these different aspects of the temple that are connected to, to priesthood language, I knew there was something more there. And that was also when I began this big search through all the documents dealing with Joseph Smith and how he viewed the endowment. And so I then, of course, this book came out with Andy Ehat and Lyndon Cook and suddenly, I think the thing that stood out to me the most was Joseph Smith's speeches to the Relief Society. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to know that now you go online and they're available just like that. But this was at a time period where you didn't even know that they existed, right? 
But as I'm looking through there, because I'd read the prophet, you know, the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, I kind of thought, well, I remember some of this stuff. I don't remember any of this having to do with women. And so then I began to compare them. And I read through very avidly every single speech that he gave to the Relief Society. And, you know, again, if you're looking in the book, it's not as easy if you just go online and hear the speeches, right? You're kind of tracing through it. And I read all these startling statements. The idea of when he, when he says, um, you know, he's going to make of them a kingdom of priests, as in Enoch's day, as in Paul's day. Woo! That just <laughs> sent me through the roof. Wow. I, I, I mean, even now when I think about it, I, I almost get teary because it's, it was transforming for me. Wow. It made me, it was, it was the answer to a prayer that God acts in different ways. God's, God's ways are higher than, than us down here. And that I saw this possibility that it wasn't, you know, me being, you know, having pro too much pride or some other problem, that I had this spiritual longing, that it was, it was there in this text that, you know, th that God was going to do this. He was going to transform the role of women in the church. And he says to the Relief Society, and as I read through these speeches carefully, I saw you know, several really important things. The idea that, um, that God was going to make the women a kingdom of priests, that was one of them. Another one was that the Relief Society, and I hope I can remember the language of this one, um, that he wanted to organize the Relief Society in the order of the priesthood. Now, you have to realize that when this later in the history of the church, and this started to happen in like eight, the 1840s and 50s after Joseph's death, were these phenomenal things that he said to the Relief Society in Nauvoo were changed, the wording was changed, so that the priesthood implications of this were all, they were switched so that it was, the language was, oh, it's not to the women, when you read the teachings of the jo of Joseph Smith by Joseph Fielding Smith, the implication is that Joseph Smith is saying this to the church, not to the women. And so, you know, the implication, and so when he says that the Relief Society is organized in the order of the priesthood, according to the order of the ancient priesthood, then it's changed to they're organized by the priesthood. I mean, that is significant. That is a very significant difference. And it's very interesting that the... Do yeah. we have a sense who changed the wording? Because I don't think it was Joseph Fielding Smith, as old as he no, was. No, no, it was older <laughs> than that. It probably, some of this started with George A. Smith in 1854. Okay. And then B.H. Roberts, another thing that B.H. Roberts did is that Joseph Smith told the Relief Society, he said, I turn the key to you. Mm-hmm. That was then changed to, I turn the key in your behalf. And um, I, I'm going to get this picture because I yeah, want to show, I, I, in an article that I did, this is really significant, this change. So um, I've written tons about this, okay? Yeah. Did, are we still okay yeah, after we're me? Fine. Yeah, that's so fine. this book, Voices for Equality, I have an essay in here. Um, this is, it starts out about the ordained women movement, Okay. but they do a lot of historical and theological contextualizing in this book, and I have a chapter in here called, I called it Retrieving the Keys. Historical mil Milestones, historical milestones in LDS women's quest for priesthood ordination. So I have an introduction, and then I have a, a chronology where I start with 1842, where Joseph Smith told the Relief Society he was going to make them a kingdom of priests as in Enoch's day, as in Paul's day. And then, and then other things. And then he says, I turn the key to you in the name of God, and this society shall rejoice, and so forth. So it's really interesting, this picture. 
So it was B.H. Roberts that changed that language. Really? Yes. And, I mean, again, you know, I don't say that these are bad men or anything. So in 1908, he changes the wording to be, well, he changes, they change the wording of a couple of things. One is that Joseph was going to make uh, the church a kingdom of priests. And then they changed the idea that I, instead of I turn the key to you, I, we turn it on your behalf. So priesthood doing it for you rather than Joseph Smith and God saying, here's your key. Mm -hmm. This is the key for you. And then the third one, the idea of that rather than the Relief Society being in the order of the priesthood, meaning they're part of the priesthood order. that it Like was, a quorum? Yes. Okay. That instead now they are, and again I have the wording in here, um, the idea that they are now organized by the priesthood rather than being in the order of the priesthood. And, um, I mean, to me these are really significant. So the reason I got the book, although it also gives me all the direct quotes, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but is I wanted to show this picture to our audience. So this is, this is a cover of a Relief Society magazine from 1936. Can you see that? Yeah. And the really interesting thing is that you have Joseph Smith giving a key to the women. Hmm. Yeah, you can see the key there. Yeah, yeah. Cool. it's really cool. And I think it's significant because, of course, the whole, I mean, there's so much argument about what is women's relationship to the priesthood. But this to me is a fascinating, and in fact, it, the, and this is interesting because um, B.H. Roberts and the other men had already changed the wording in the history of the church. But notice on this cover it says, I now turn the king to you in the name of God, and this society shall rejoice, and knowledge and intelligence shall flow down from this time. That is the original quote. So the fascinating thing is how did that quote get there when the official history at the time had, I turn it in your behalf? Hmm. I'm trying to zoom in on the quote there. I'll yeah. probably have to zoom that post. That's okay. But I, it's such a fascinating thing. And I talk about that picture in this article. But you know when, but I actually discovered these changes in 1980 mm -hmm. by comparing the Andy E. Hat and Lyndon Cook version to what was in the Teachings of the Prophet, which was also what was in the History of the Church by B. H. Roberts, right? Mm -hmm. And again, I mean, I already got really emotional about this, but that was startling for me because it did feel like a personal answer to my prayers that my desires for something different were not just ambition and pride and all of these things, but that so the, the, these spiritual longings were not misplaced. Well, see, this brings up a bunch of questions for me because, you know, I know in the community of Christ, and it's funny that you're mentioning this is the 1980s, it was 1984, I had a revelation that eventually led to a split in their church, which was to allow women to be yeah. ordained. And so women in the community of Christ are ordained elders, bishops, apostles, right. Right. everything. But it sounds to me, as you as you read that quote, if the Relief Society is supposed to be a separate quorum, that sounds like a different structure than, say, the community of Christ. Would you agree with that? Well, and yeah, I'm going to come back to that because I feel like that the that the answer to this is complicated mm -hmm. and that um, I feel like that what I see that Joseph Smith was trying to do, I did not, I do not think God entirely developed. So I'm going to answer this indirectly, again through sort of a tangent, okay. but I'm going to come back to that exact question. Because, and this really comes to a central question that's discussed now, which is, is the priesthood of the temple any different than the priesthood of the church. Okay. So um, I was learning all this stuff. So in 1984, and it's so interesting. <laughs> this is the same year. The same year, and I had no idea. I mean, it took, I didn't know for like two or three years that this had happened in the community of Christ. 
But in 1984, um, I wrote this paper. It was my first Sunstone paper. Mm. I was pregnant with my youngest daughter. Oh, wow. I'd been going to the BYU library, also looking at all these old women's exponent m books while, you know, whenever I could. And my paper was called The Missing Rib the forgotten place of queens and priestesses in the establishment of Zion. And there are sort of four or five major ideas that I said here that are going to relate back to your question. Okay. And these are, first of all, I really analyzed the, the Nauvoo, Joseph Smith's speeches to the Relief Society. So I looked at those. And what I concluded from them was that Joseph Smith viewed priesthood in a much more expansive way than we often do in the church today. That we connect it. Yeah, we talk about it as the power of God, but we really focus on the way it functions within the church. And that I, from my perspective, I saw that it was this larger thing that had larger implications. And I didn't fully develop it all there, but later in the book I did with my husband, Strangers in Paradox, in 1990, I kind of flesh it all out. But so these ideas that I bring out in that article that Joseph Smith's view of priesthood are larger. And so, for example, when I read all of his statements about Elijah and Elijah bring keys, it was not, yes, he brought sealing keys, but that wasn't the major thing. According to Joseph Smith, what Elijah brought was the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood. And I realized that that Melchizedek priesthood was different than what they talked about in the church. Not different in sense of that still priesthood power, Joseph said, all priesthood power is one, but there are different portions and degrees. But to be a high priest in the church was not the same thing as being a high priest in the holy order to have the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood. So that was the second thing. So, um, and then, so priesthood was different, that Elijah brought the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood, and I, I have the quote, but he says basically that the fullness of the Melchizedek, fullness of the priesthood that Elijah brought was to have the keys of the revelations and the oracles and the power of God and to be able to both receive and obtain and bestow all the ordinances of God. And the more you look at this, he, the, he saw the endowment and the second anointings as that process by which you get the fullness of the priesthood. And then in the same article, I talk about the September 28, 1843 anointing of Joseph Smith and Emma Smith to the fullness of the priesthood. They're anointed jointly. And I saw that as an important key for women. The idea is, if you look at all the statements of Joseph Smith, that when you have the fullness of the priesthood, you really have the right to everything else. So that what I propose then, and this goes back to your question, is that in a way, it was almost like Joseph was saying that the women could sidestep all the, you know, going through all those stages, that as soon as you had the fullness of the Melchizedek, and of course the temple also gives you the fullness of the Aaronic, that really you have this fullness, I would see it like an umbrella, like your, your little light things here, that the fullness of Melchizedek priesthood encompasses everything else. Now, this created a problem. I can tell. <laughs> because really what he did was he set up two mechanisms by which you obtain priesthood. And he never worked that out. So you have the church priesthood. Actually, I would say that Joseph Smith, through the stages, had three different kind of stages of priesthood. There's the charismatic priesthood. There's ecclesiastical priesthood. The fullness of the priesthood, which he also called the messianic priesthood. It, it, it encompasses everything. But, and I think that he felt like there should be a relationship between the fullness and the ecclesiastical. 
but that he never developed that. And so he left this, these remnants of two systems that can seem like they don't correspond or you're not sure what they do. And I mean, we can come back to some of this because I want to go back to your other question. After he died, you had Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball and George A. Smith and all of these others who began to try to sort of bring this under control, both in terms of the Relief Society and in terms of how people viewed the endowment. So that it was like, oh, well, this thing over here that's the fullness of the priesthood that's through the temple, it has to be under the control of the church. And the, the thing that the women got, it was not really the priesthood, they're just an auxiliary. So, and we, there's more here we can talk about. So, and, but the other thing that I argued in this paper was that, and, and this goes back to how Joseph Smith viewed the priesthood. I really believe that one of the most important aspects of Joseph Smith's revelations as a response to sort of problems in general Christianity were the way in which he tried to marry the spiritual and the physical. That if you look at the history of Christianity going back to the early church fathers, they created a dichotomy. Here's heaven up here. Here's the spiritual. Here's God up here. And then we're in this fallen world and the physical world is lower and not good. And you have to escape the physical to go up to heaven. And I think that Joseph Smith saw God and, and of course, this is in the basic Christian message of God coming down to the world, being incarnated, which is to be in the body, right? And redeeming the physical world so that the idea is that you bring heaven down to earth and that Zion, and this goes back to the title of my speech, Zion is about bringing those realms together so that you have a community where you have spiritual and social and economic equality that allows everyone to flourish. And what I realized as I was reading all of this is that from Joseph Smith's point of view, and again, if you go back to the early church fathers, you know, Eve introduces evil into the world. Women can be the gateway to temptation and hell. There's some medieval writers it's that say that. It's a little different now. Now women are just on a pedestal. They can't do anything wrong, right? Yeah, no, it's true. <laughs> well, actually, that's interesting because it's a flip-flop. I right? know, it You're is. You're either a virgin or a whore, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're one or the other. You're either on the pedestal, and that really didn't happen until... Uh, Victorian in the 19th century uh, times, but you're either like the gateway to hell, or you're on the pedestal, and you're, un, you know, you're pure and you're no you're sexuality. So pure, you don't yeah, need you don't have. Food. That's right. <laughs> you don't need to shave your legs or, yeah. or 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 have any bodily fluids, right? <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. But I really think one of his biggest contributions was trying to to show the inherent goodness of the physical world that yes, it's fallen, we have sin, but, but really our bodies are inherently good, sexuality is inherently good, women are inherently good, not just in the Victorian sense, but that they have, and that was it, the missing rib, the forgotten place that queens and priestesses, that women are essential to establishing Zion, not simply because, oh, we need their contribution and they have babies and every man's got to have a wife or you can't be exalted if you don't have a wife, but that there's something about what women can do that you cannot have the Zion society without their spiritual, that was what I was focusing on. They're not just their spiritual in the sense of, oh, women are so pure and good, but their theology and their, the, their imagination and their ambitions and everything about them, right? And <clears throat> so I saw that as very important. So in the next, I would say that after that, so I, I kind of saw really some important ideas there, and that was my first speech. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Margaret Toscano. In our next conversation, Margaret has a very interesting definition of priesthood. And if you think about the primary purpose of priesthood is that, that by receiving the Spirit of God, serving other people, doing these things, the ordinances and so forth, and working to build a just society, 
that it transforms you. You literally become transformed into the image of God. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.